at NCC, A18 Missions is part of our core identity, and it's simply to be in solidarity with and to embody justice and compassion towards others. We're going to listen well. We're going to be humble. We're going to seek justice. We're going to love mercy. And so I just want to share some good news, some ways in which compassion is being embodied through our community in our local neighborhoods and around the world. In local side, Jonathan Tate, he's an NCCer. He started an organization a while back called Food on the Stove, and they are providing meals as we speak uh, for firefighters as they continue to do their work in our cities. Our homes, not borders. They're providing basic needs for 18 newly resettled refugees, providing laptops, families that are struggling and we are trying to be present with them. In Guatemala, Emily Gomez, an NCCer that's part of Champions in Action, one of our partners, they have shifted from their soccer camps that they're not able to do to providing food bags, basic needs. Over 1,500 people, uh, uh, meals are provided every month. 35% of families, that is their only source of food. And 80% of these families have experienced job loss. And so uh, we want to continue to show compassion towards our family in Guatemala, as well as DR Congo. Over 100,000 families have been impacted by tremendous flooding. And our partner, uh, P Pastor Jeremiah and Congo Center for Christ, providing 275 meals a day for families. And NCC continues to invest in that. As we go into this time, just want to pray the Lord's Prayer over us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. Your word, moving power, and 
Bible is a book about real people with real problems, but a real God with real solutions. The Apostle Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. Anybody have a thorn in the flesh? It's the place where you feel the greatest shame. It's the place where you feel the greatest weakness. It's the place where you experience your greatest brokenness. I want you to know today, the Apostle Paul begged three times, take it from me, but what did God say? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. I believe that today. His grace is sufficient. I wanna pray for you right now. God, I pray that your grace would invade the reality of our lives right now and reach the places where we experience hurt. Lord, the memories that haunt us, the mistakes that we've made. Lord, the pain that's been inflicted on us, the injustice that we've experienced. I pray your grace, a grace that is you, as unique as our fingerprint to right now, by the Holy Spirit, minister to everybody within the hearing of this voice. Holy Spirit, come. Make your presence known. Your healing power, God, and your deliverance, you're the one who can make us whole again. And so, Lord, I pray an extra measure of grace. And I pray it in Jesus' name. If you believe that wherever you are right now, would you say amen? So be it. Amen. I want to say thank you for joining us at our online campus. Uh, many of us, of course, uh, from the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. But you know what? All across the country, all around the world, uh, we have folks who are part of our extended family, part of our online campus. And you know what? We'd love to know where you're from. And so if that's you, if you would hop on that chat at the online campus, we'd love to know where you're from. And I want to say a huge welcome, whatever time zone you are in, uh, it's a joy to be able to be together. We want to help you find faith with your fingerprint on it. We want to help you take your next step in your spiritual journey. And so ncc.re slash connect. We want to serve you uh, however, whenever, wherever we can. I want to say thanks uh, for your faithfulness in giving, especially during these times of great uncertainty. Now, if you're a guest, no obligation to give, but uh, I wanna say thanks to those of you who have so faithfully and so generously invested in what God is doing in and through National Community Church at the outset. You're, you heard Pastor Dave share a little bit uh, about all that is happening around the world that we get to be shareholders in. And so, thank you. A couple of ways to give that you'll see right there on your screen. Well, it was 24 years ago that Laura and I started pastoring a core group of 19 people. Two of those people were Dick and Ruth Foth. Uh, he has been a spiritual father to me, uh, a spiritual grandfather to this church ever since. It is an absolute joy to welcome him, uh, to share the message from him, his home office in Fort Collins, Colorado. Would you just open your mind, your heart, your spirit 
to everything that God wants to do in you this weekend. May God give you a hunger, an insatiable hunger for his word that our weekend messages cannot satisfy. Ready or not, here we go. CC family. There you are. I can't see you. You can see me, but this is, it seems virtual, but it's real. Okay. We are looking in this series on Shaken at the story of Daniel, and it's been articulated so well over these past weeks with the pastoral team. And when I look at it from where I sit, my vantage, this story and our times have really made me look at myself. I, um, I look at my principles, I look at my values, I look at my actions. I loved what Pastor Mark said last week about those old guys, you know, those old guys who end up with a twinkle in their eye and fire in their belly. I, I'd like to go there. I'd like to be one of those. But if I do, I need to be willing to be self-assessing. That's critical for me at this time. So I have to ask myself the question, after all these years, what matters? Who am I? Daniel 6 speaks to that. Let me start with a story of a boy named Phil. He was born in Rome, Pennsylvania in 1838, and he had no formal schooling till he was 10. His father Isaac was a, was a dedicated believer, and the first spiritual recollections that Phil had of his father were the daily family, family rituals of prayer. These prayers were ingrained into him in childhood and into his memory, and they stayed with him throughout his life. His dad was a lover of music, and it was through his dad that he developed, he, Phil, developed a passion for singing. They went to a Methodist church there in Pennsylvania. In his teens, Phil discovered that he had the ability to compose music, and he started writing songs, and he sent his first composition to a fellow named George, I think, who was a songwriter. It was a gospel song, and this was the note he attached. If you think this song is worth anything, I would appreciate having a flute in exchange for it. Talk about a strange request. Well, apparently the fellow thought it had some merit because Phil got a flute. The boy's name was Philip Bliss. He went on in his adult life to be a gospel song songwriter in the 1800s of quite great merit. He was a good friend of Dwight Moody, the great evangelist of the day, and he moved to Chicago. Phil and his family, married, had a couple of kids, moved to Chicago in the mid-1800s, during the Civil War actually, wrote a lot of great songs. And then there was a tragedy on December 29, 1876. He and his wife died in a tragic train accident just outside Ashtabula, Ohio. And he was 38 years old, and he'd written all these songs. But this one, he had written three years earlier, stands out to me at this moment in time. It was written in 1873, and it's called Dare to Be a Daniel. Some of you may have sung it in Sunday school or children's church or something back in the day. I think it might have been written for adults of his Sunday school class at the church he was at in Chicago, but this is how it goes. Standing by a purpose true, Heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Here's the refrain, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. It became a kid's song along the way, and as I said, some of you may have sung it. So here's Daniel 6. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Here's Daniel 6, a story of betrayal, jealous men, hungry lions. End of the story, good guy wins. So the question is, what can we learn from this moment 
2,500 years ago in a very different culture, in a very different time and place. As you know, and you've heard over these last weeks, Daniel was a young teen when he was taken from Jerusalem. He was part of a noble family, no doubt, transported hundreds of miles to Babylon, became an advisor to the king. He was 17 when he moved into a role like that. I think he probably thought he'd go home, but he didn't. His whole life was spent in Babylon. He will never get to go home. And now, in this story, as in last week, he's 80-ish, 80-something, we think. His given name, Daniel, means God is my judge. That's his metric. The Babylonians changed his name to Belteshazzar. They could change his name, but they could not change his heart. And so we need to see Daniel in this story particularly through that lens. God is my judge. I, I want to respond to and please him. At 17, as we read in the first chapter, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's food and everything worked out great. You can go back and read it again if you want. And now it's more than 60 years later and he still resolved to worship and honor Yahweh. The rhythms that he learned when he was small have stayed with him. They have become his default. So this is how it reads. Daniel 6 one, it pleased Darius the king to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So 120, three over them, one is Daniel. He's in that elite group. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. They're there to take care of the king's kingdom and his stuff. Now Darius ruled a large area, Middle East, part of the Med, coastal North Africa, and a satrap, I love that word, wouldn't it be great to go to school to, and you say, what did your dad do? Well, he's a satrap. A satrap was a combination of a tax collector, a judge. They built the armies. They often were royal family members. So Daniel was one of those. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Heir apparent. Going to be heir apparent to that whole kingdom. The challenge for Daniel is that he's already heir apparent in another kingdom. His biological and spiritual roots are in another location, and I don't mean just Jerusalem. Here's the deal. From his childhood, he's put God first. He's been taught and trained to do that. Putting God first determines everything that follows. I know that last week, um, Pastor Mark was kind enough to talk about us old guys. But I'd like to talk about the kids for just a moment. Those of you with small children, by gifting your children with kids' church, by gifting your children with story time on that Instagram thing that your kids' folks do, it's wonderful for you to have gatherings with your family and let them know who you worship. That's huge. It's making the foundation. It is laying the foundation for the house that will be built. And Daniel shows a unique spiritual maturity when he's young. Some of my best spiritual memories were from summer camp. You've heard me talk about this fellow that I met back when I was 10 years old at my first summer camp. His name was Roy Blakely. He ended up some years later being my father-in-law. But one of the great things about Roy Blakely is that he told us stories about Jesus and he talked to us. We were just kids, right? We we're in all, kids in all kinds of stuff. I'm 10 years old for Pete's sake, which I think might be the perfect age, but that's another thought for another message. But he talked to us like we were real. That's what he did. And in so doing, it opened us up to hearing about a God in Jesus who is real. We were developing, we were supple, we were open, and we started learning to worship God and listen to him and love him. That truth of putting God first is embedded in Jesus' words 500 years after Daniel. This is how it reads in Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. When you seek, first, when you seek God first and you start thinking that way, it translates over time into action. We pray that it will. 
I just had a conversation just today, actually, with my friend Bob Cooley, who's the former president at Gordon Conwell Seminary, a wonderfully esteemed uh, man, scholar, educator. And we were talking about Daniel. We were talking about this. And I asked him, what does righteousness, that is being right with God, look like in the scriptures? And he said, the gospel is only an idea until it translates to action. And in the Old and New Testaments, it always carries the aspect of community. And my pedigree is in that community. It was somewhere other. It is somewhere other than just in the here and now. And then he went on to reflect on the words of Paul the Apostle. And I was tickled because the very words he was quoting from Philippians, the third chapter, I already had in my message notes. So th this is what he quoted, Philippians 3, 7 to 10. But whatever were gains to me, Paul the Apostle says, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And he goes on to say, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And he went on to say, Dr. Cooley went on to say, we are citizens of a different place. And this really shows up when Daniel is about to take a hit. These are the next verses, Daniel 6. At, the, at this, because he was such a good leader, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was one, trustworthy, two, neither corrupt, or three, negligent. Trustworthy, neither corrupt, that is, he's not in it for himself. He's not negligent, you'll always get his best. So you can't buy him and you can't beat him. He, is, he has taken responsibility for caring for the king's business with integrity. As I reflect on that and I say, who's my king and what's his business? How do I care for that? How can I be a trustworthy steward so that I can't be corrupted in that process and I always give it 110%? So here's the point. Let the quality of our lives and work be our message. Reputation is what we have. You know, we talk about a body of work between players and coaches and musicians and writers and builders and teachers, any craft, any profession, you hear that. Highest accolade you could get is somebody saying, boy, I would love to work with or for that person. I uh, had the privilege some years ago, as many of you know, when I was in town back in the first part of this century, 2000 to 2008, when I was there, had a couple of friends who were in government, and one of them was the head of the Navy, Vern Clark. I've mentioned him before. But I remember being queried by one of his aides, who was a Marine Corps major. And he asked me, what do you talk about when you go there? Because you go for lunch, and these guys live their lives in 15-minute increments. And I said, well, we do those things that you find in the New Testament. You meet together. We talk about our lives. We maybe have some food. We, we talk about who is this Jesus person and we have a prayer. And this person looked at me and said, that is awesome. There is some sense in having, finding a person who is trustworthy, not corruptible, not negligent, that is so attractive. So Daniel, finally these men, we will never find any basis, Daniel 6, 5, for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They knew if they could get to that piece, they'd have him. Can you see him? They're just gleeful. They're just so excited because they've got him. If they can go there, they'll get him. And they sort of start counting their chickens before they hatch, as we said back in the day. So, and I know I'm reading a lot of scripture, but th this really is where the story is. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. 
The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed, well, all except Daniel, that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So, King Darius put the decree in writing. What, what's, the Babylon, what's the Babylonian phrase for kiss up? What's the Babylonian phrase for pandering? This is clearly what it is. Well, what's interesting about this, when Daniel found out, he didn't react. He just did what he always did. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. He's not going private. He's not going silent. And he kneels, prays toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and praised, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. It's interesting. It doesn't say, God, get me out of this, at least not according to this text. Then these men went as a group, found Daniel praying and asked, asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. And the story goes on in, and frames it as you would imagine it would. And in verse 13, it says, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, the king knows this, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel, made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius, said, remember your majesty, according to the law and so forth. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king's next few words speak volumes about his relationship with Daniel, I think. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. And there, courage shows up on Daniel's part. Daniel refused to compromise his practices. What are the routines or rhythms that I have? I've, I've been reflecting on this. What are my routines or rhythms that give life to me? What are the habits of my heart? What words, what things feed my soul? We live in a world, don't we? I mean, it's craziness, a world of drowning that's drowning in opinions. And they're not worth fighting over or for. I got to tell you, what are the few convictions that I would go to the wall for? Boldness in a time of great upheaval is, I think, a great virtue when it's in line with the character of God. We had a baptismal service out here in Colorado some time back, sort of one of my favorite testimonials. A man was getting baptized and he said, you know, I work at a used car dealership. And uh, when I went there, there was this one salesman who always read his Bible at lunch. The other guys would all make fun of him, but he befriended me. And I started reading the Bible with him. And over time, I started believing that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And I, um, I actually came to Jesus in the parking lot between a Ford F-150 and a Mercury Milan. I, lo <laughs> I love that story boldness of a man to read the scriptures in front of his friends when they were making fun of him. So the text goes on to say that a stone was rolled over the mouth of the opening to the lion's den. The king sealed it with a signet ring and the other nobles. He went back and he didn't sleep all night. He didn't have any entertainment. Gets up early in the morning and goes to the lion's den and shouts in an anguished voice. So what it says in verse 20, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue from the lions. He had to just breathe such a sigh of relief and say yes when he hears Daniel say, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. And I've never done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed. It's always good when the king's overjoyed. And Daniel didn't hold it against the king. So the deal is we may suffer in circumstances or even because of jealousies or intent because of our convictions. But those circumstances and things can shape us or break us. Corrie ten Boom, that Dutch lady who hid the Jews, who is buried in Southern California, 100 feet from where my mother's body lies. She harbored Jews. 
suffered greatly, lost most of her families. But there's something about suffering that shapes us, and I'll come to that again in a moment. But the things that happen when we're small, the spiritual experiences we have, the things that touch our, our young people, our teenagers. Um, I, I, as a grandfather, Ruth and I, pray almost every day by name for our 12 grandchildren and now our two great grandchildren. I, I'm thinking of Daniel who's 17, 14 actually, when they started training him. And I'm thinking to myself, can we have teens in this day who are tough in spirit? I say yes. I say we can. And because of their openness and because of our efforts, I believe that can happen. We come back to Admiral Stockdale's paradox that Pastor Mark talked about the first week, that, which is, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Those two things in juxtaposition, this is real, I still trust for tomorrow. Suffering can break us or make us. So I'm on a flight, 1992, back to the West Coast from the East Coast. I'm sitting next to a young man. He's grading some papers. Turned out that he is the son, one of the sons of Admiral Stockdale. We start talking. I said, how was it? He said, my mom raised four of us teenage boys for those seven and a half years that my dad was away, and she held us together. And we kept believing that he would come back. And when he came back, I saw something. I said, how had he changed? He said, when he went in, he was a hard driving, high tech, brilliant fighter jock. I loved him. When he came back, he was a human being. In our present circumstance, we have never needed to listen to God more. Extreme things can break our humanity or reveal it. Many people in these days need to have their humanity affirmed by our voice, yours and mine, by our question, yours and mine, by our actions, yours and mine. And when we face what we think is the impossible, I think the things I think are impossible probably don't even raise God's eyebrows. God is the one who does the impossible. This book is full of apparent impossibilities that God overwhelms. So here's the rest of the story. Rest of the story is this. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused David were brought, and the short of it, the long and the short of it is, they were gone. Daniel found that his motivation and his refuge lay in one place, an audience with the Most High. When we have an audience with the Most High, when we speak to the king of the universe in the morning, everything can change. When we play for, as an athlete, we play for the coach, don't play for the crowd. My friend Sarah Groves sang a song some years ago that I found to be tremendously helpful. She said, this journey is my own. And she has some lines in there that say, I play for an audience, I sing for an audience of one. I want us to take a sila moment and just calm our spirits and listen to Sarah Groves' song. It'll take a few minutes, but let's reflect and let it bathe us and let's think about it. Here it is. When I stand before the Lord, I'll be standing alone. This journey is my own. Still I want man's advice, and I need man's approval, but this journey to make myself 
This is how it ends. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He, ha he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. If I'm a Daniel, I'll be trustworthy and you can count on me. I'll be capable. I'll find excellent ways to execute the mission. I'll be courageous. I'll have the heart of a lion. Some years ago, when I was president at Bethany, there was a young man who was going to be a senior the next year. He is now in his 60s. He's a leader in Northern California. And I saw him last year and I said, Steve, wonderful guy, I said, Steve, now that you're in your 60s, what have you learned about life? And he looked at me and said, President Foth, he always called me president. I said, you know, but he said, President Foth, what I found is that at my age, I have less to prove and more to offer. Less to prove and more to offer. Let's go there with Daniel, shall we? God, help us to be people with less to prove and more to offer. Let's pray. Father, here we are. We submit ourselves to you. Help us to keep our focus in crazy days that we sing and work and play for an audience of one. We want you to be that audience and we want to be your people in fresh dimensions every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, love you, hope to see you soon, bye-bye.
with human hands treasure for the trade no ear has heard no eye has seen the image of the Father until heaven came to live with me God who makes the sun stand still. He is still the God who makes sidewalks through the sea. He is still the God who shuts the mouths of lions. Unshaken, 
It's refusing to compromise your convictions, even if it lands you in a fiery furnace, even if it lands you in a lion's den. It is confronting the brutal facts with unwavering faith, even if it takes 70 years for God to deliver on his promise. Can I remind you, God's got this. God's got you. Don't lose faith in the end of the story and don't lose faith in the end of your story. God can rewrite the narrative of your life. Would you fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith today? Because it's not finished. It's not over. There is a God who can redeem the pain and the difficult situations. I, I, here's the deal. We're gonna sing one more song. But we're gonna pray. Our prayer team is ready and waiting to pray with you and for you. I'm gonna tell you who exactly uh, we're gonna pray for. You're in the fight of your life right now. You're in a compromising situation. You need the courage to say what needs to be said and to do what needs to be done. And that courage is gonna come from the Holy Spirit helping you. And we wanna stand with you in prayer. And so if you're at our online campus, would you hit that live prayer button and let our team, when two or three believe together, something powerful happens. And so I'm believing for a breakthrough in your life. Now, did you catch what Dr. Foe said at the very end there? When you get older, less to prove, more to offer, but less to prove. You don't have anything to prove today. God proved it at Calvary's cross. He loves you. Religion is spelled do. It's all about what we can do for God. It's all about proving ourselves to God. That is a dead end, my friend. Christianity is spelled done. It's about what Christ accomplished on the cross for us. He proved his love for you. All you have to do is just receive it as a gift as a gift of grace. If you wanna make that decision today and you're at our online campus, would you raise a hand right now? It takes a little bit of courage, but would you take a step of faith and say, I wanna surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It will change your life. And so we'll sing one more song. Uh, next weekend, we're gonna continue the series uh, I believe that God is doing a profound work in and through us as a church. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You hit that live prayer button. You need to make that decision. You raise your hand. And let's seize this moment and enter in and believe that God has something for us, a breakthrough for us in these next couple of minutes. Here we go.
This is my 